spiteful that thou now danced to your partner who wealth the floor your trotters shake. Wasn't it the truth? I told you lots of fun at Finnegan's Wake. One morning Tim was rather full, his head felt heavy which made him shake. He fell from the ladder and broke his skull, so they carried him home, his corpse to wake. They rolled him up in a nice... River run, past Eve and Adams, from swerve of shore to bend of bay, brings us by a commodious vicus of recirculation back to Hoth, Castle and Environs. Sir Tristram, viler d'amores, for over the short sea had Pazancourt re-arrived from North Armorica, on this side the scraggy isthmus of Europe Minor, to wielder fight his peninsular war. Nor had Topsoyer's rocks by the stream O'Conny exaggerated themselves to Lawrence County's gorgios while they went doubling their mumper all the time. Nor a voice from a fire bellowsed Misha, Misha to Tauf, Tauf, Thwart Petrick. Not yet, though Venice soon after, had a kid's gad butt ended a bland old Isaac. Not yet, though all's fair in vanity, where so the Sester's wrath with Tuon Nathan Joe. Rot a peck of Paz malt had gem or shen brewed by arc light, and Rory end to the Regenbrow was to be seen ringsome on the aqua face. Joyce published Finnegan's Wake in 1939. It was his last and most complex novel, and it's not an easy book to summarise. There's no real plot. There are characters, but their identities and their names are constantly changing. Joyce described the book as a dream, in fact the dream of the fallen Irish giant Finn McCool. But in another sense, it could be the dream of Tim Finnegan, who fell from the ladder, cracked his skull, whose body was taken back for a wake, where he was magically revived by a drop of whiskey. The Mooks and the Gripes Gents and lady men, full stoppers and semi-colonials, hybrids and lubbards. Eins within a space, and a weary wide space it was, a wound a mooks. The onesomeness was all too lonely, Arkansas like, broadly oval, and a mooks he would a walking go, my hood, cries Antony Romeo. So one grand summer evening, after a great morning, and his good supper of gammon and spittish, Having flabbled his eyes, pillioled his nostrils, vaticanated his ears, and palliumed his throats, he put on his impermeable, seized his impunable, harped on his crown, and stepped out of his immobile de rure albo, so called, be called it was chalk full of master plasters, and had gorgeously let out gardens strewn with cascadas, pintacostecas, orthodoxes, and currycombs and set off from Ludstown, Aspasso, to see how badness was badness in the weirdest of all pensable ways. As he set off with his father's sword, his lancia spezzata, he was girded on, and with that between his legs and his tar heels, our once in only Bragspear, he clanked to my clinking from vetoes to treetop, every inch of an immortal. He had not walked over a pentiad pair of parsecs from his asylum when at the turning of the shinstone lantern near St. Bowery's without his walls, he came, seconding to the one one oneth of the prophecies, amnis limnia permanent, upon the most unconsciously boggy-looking stream he ever locked his eyes with. Out of the colleens it took a rise by daubing itself ninon. It looked little, and it smelt of brown, and it thought in narrows, and it talked show shallow. And as it rin, it dribbled like any lively pearlet easy. My, 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 me and me, little down dream, don't I love thee? And I declare, what was there on the yonder bank of the stream that would be a river, parched on the limb of the olum, bolt downright, but the gripes? And no doubt he was fit to be dried, for why had he not been having the juice of his times? Finnegan's Wake is a notoriously difficult book. The language is often impenetrable. And so it was a great challenge working on this project, but also a lot of fun. And I was constantly amazed by the way in which Barry McGovern would get his mouth around words, sentences, whole pages, and bring the book to life. 
evoking character, using accents in a way which simply the reader cannot anticipate. Because Joyce is not very helpful with, for example, punctuation a lot of the time, and he doesn't make it clear who is speaking certain lines of dialogue. We use two readers because there are some passages of the book which are clearly spoken by Anna Livia Plurabelle, or by women gossiping about Anna Livia Plurabelle, as in the passage where two washerwomen by the river are gossiping about Anna. One is older, one is younger. But Joyce doesn't tell you which is which. You have to work this out for yourself. Oh, tell me all about Anna Livia. I want to hear all about Anna Livia. Well, you know Anna Livia. Yes, of course. We all know Anna Livia. Tell me all. Tell me now. You'll die when you hear. Well, you know when the old Cheb went foot and did what, you know. Yes, I know. Go on. Wash, quit, and don't be dabbling. Took up your sleeves and loosen your talk tapes. And don't butt me. Hoik! When you bend. Or whatever it was they three to make out, he tried to too in the fiendish park. He's an awful old rep. Look at the short of him. Look at the dirt of us. He's only water black on me, and it's steepin' and stupin' since this time last wick. How many goes is it I wonder I washed it? I know be hard the places he likes to sally, the dirty devil, scorchin' my hand and starvin' me famine to make his private linen public. But well with your battle and cleanest.